I'm with Bishop Fintan Monaghan, who is the Bishop of Killaloo here in Ireland. Thank you for being with us, Bishop. Uh, you've been a bishop now for, I think, just about two years, is that Just about correct? two years, just yes. Just about two years. 2016. How did you find the transition from your previous ministry to that of a bishop? Well, I suppose it, it, it is a fairly dramatic transition in the sense that for many years I was chaplain in a school and I was uh, teaching in, in, in a secondary school, Dawson mm -hmm. College, and also I was secretary, uh, Dawson secretary in the Archdiocese of Chum. So effectively you're the other side of the desk, you're dealing yeah. with administration and uh, communication with people in various parishes. But as bishop then, it's, it's almost like the life of a politician in many ways. You're out and about all the time. You're, you're not, certainly not at the desk as, as much as you would be when you were secretary. Um, but I must say it's been a most life-giving and uh, enthralling and interesting and challenging uh, new turn to the vocation of priesthood. Um, very fulfilling in the sense that there's great human contact, great pastoral outreach to it in all of the 58 parishes of the, the vast diocese that Killaloo is and of course the, the different interaction that one would have with the Episcopal Conference and various different you know, international events like we have here uh, for the World Meeting of Families and that. So it has been quite a dramatic change, but a very interesting one, very fulfilling one, very challenging one, uh, very blessed in, in, in many ways, despite all of the obvious difficulties and challenges and mountains to climb, I suppose, in many ways. Well, given those difficulties and those challenges, I, I hear from many priests saying, you know, who would want to be a bishop uh, in these days with all of these challenges? Um, what's your take on life as a bishop? Well, sure, I, I suppose it is a call to, to service, and that's what priesthood is, is and it's, it's very much a, uh, an individual call that God calls you to serve in whatever way your, your talents are, are there. Um, I must say there's a huge amount of goodwill, a huge amount of help, despite, I suppose, some of the uh, I suppose, negative things that one would tend to hear. But on the ground, there's a huge amount of positivity. Um, there's a huge decline in the number of people that are practicing, but the number of people that are practicing are very serious about their faith. And I see it right across uh, practically every parish of the diocese that I've worked in uh, and, and the previous diocese that I was as well. People are more than willing to put their shoulder to the wheel, uh, lay people to take responsibility and ownership for their faith, and a lot of the time in the absence of, of priests being available, and that is something that we're trying to encourage and trying to develop, and it's part of the vision of, I suppose, Vatican II, um, that, that lay people would get involved as much as possible. So I see a huge amount of activity going on, a huge amount of genuine, uh, faith-filled, spirit-filled work going on, and many new green shoots beginning to emerge in different directions. And even in terms of young people, while you might not see as many young people at Mass on a Sunday, if you go around to the schools, if you get involved with John Paul II Awards, Youth 2000 events, various different youth pilgrimage activities like World Youth Day, all of that, mm. young people are so willing to get involved at that mm. level. You know, if it's outdoor faith events, they will turn up and they will sing and they will pray and that. You know, so there's a great amount of goodwill towards, towards faith, towards Catholicism, towards trying to be genuine disciples and followers of, of Jesus Christ in, in so many ways. And I'm very encouraged and very happy to see that. And I think it's a matter of adjusting to the fact that what Pope Benedict has been predicting for you know, decades, that in Europe we're already becoming a, a, a we're, 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 we're not becoming, we are a minority, but a creative mm. minority mm. and maybe a prophetic mm. voice in, in society for, for people. So it's a different reality to the sort of church that we would have had when we'd say Pope John Paul II came in 1979. Uh, but in some ways, perhaps a, a more healthy, more authentic, more, I suppose, vibrant church in, 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 in a lot of different ways. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because uh, over the years, uh, I've, I've done a lot of traveling and I've, I always found that when you go to a country where uh, Catholicism is a minority, uh, it seemed always to be more fervent and more fa faith-filled than it was perhaps in Ireland in those days. So mm -hmm. I take the point that you're making very mm -hmm. seriously. Mm -hmm. um, vocations to the priesthood are scarce these days. Mm -hmm. How is your diocese doing? Well, like, a, like a, every other diocese, we're, we're plugging away. We're still very much saying that we're absolutely open for business. We're encouraging um, you know, young vocations as much as we possibly can. We have a good 
Vibrant Vocations Committee, with the Ador Eucharistic Adoration Committee, pray very fervently like world priests do on a Thursday for vocations to the priesthood. We do our best to, to, to pray, to work hard, to alert people that, that uh, we, we certainly are looking for, for good young priests. Uh, we've had mixed success, I suppose, like every other, uh, other diocese. Uh, at the moment, we have a new student starting his propagutic year. Uh, we had one ordination this summer, thanks be to God. Uh, we have one student from Zagreb, from Croatia, who settled in, in uh, the eastern half of the diocese, was considering a monastic vocation at one stage, but decided he wanted something more evangelical. He's halfway through his, his training. A number of other uh, students have been discerning over the past number of years, and for whatever reason, they have postponed their decision. Uh, we had three or four other people that were in uh, seminary, uh, but have taken time out. So whether they will come back or not, I'm not sure. So we're, we're not the worst, but not the best either. Uh, but we're trying very hard to promote vo vocations in the priesthood. I suppose like any other diocese, are the numbers uh, uh, of, of priests that we have are, are in sharp decline. We have 98 priests in the diocese at the moment. Some of them are retired with 58 parishes. Uh, so we would be struggling in terms of uh, having a you know a priest for every mm. uh, parish mm. and every mm. rural parish. Mm. But we've new, moved to a new system this year where we have co-PPs in pastoral areas. Uh, and that facilitates the fact that maybe small rural parishes might be able to share a parish priest of the neighboring parish. It's a new system. It's fairly radical, I suppose, in, in moving in that direction. But it's what we need to do. But on the other hand, then, as I mentioned a while ago, Many of the lay people are getting very involved in sacramental training, yeah. helping out if the need arises with lay-led liturgies. Uh, different, uh, you know, faith initiatives, catechesis, we're trying to introduce the ministry of catechist, uh, pastoral workers as well in the diocese. We've, uh, we're trying to introduce a training program for that, and we've information days in the autumn on that. And there has been a great response to that so far. So, uh, you know, the priests are working away very diligently and also the, the lay people, the wonderful lay people in the parishes are very much stepping up to the mark um, to, to, to fulfil their sense of vocation as well in, in a different way that the priests would, but in a very complementary way. And I think that's, that is very much the vision of, of uh, the Second Vatican Council that we've been trying to implement for the last, you know, uh, half, a, half a century. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, you were, and you mentioned it uh, earlier, you were diocesan secretary, you were secretary to the uh, Archbishop of Toom, uh, Archbishop Michael Neary, for a number of years. And Archbishop Michael, of course, uh, is the Episcopal advisor to World Priest and has been from the beginning. So in your position as secretary, you had a lot of dealings with World Priest and you've seen it grow almost from, from the beginning. How do you view the success of the World Priest Apostolate and does it make a difference, do you think? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's a great support for, for priesthood. It's a great support for faith. Uh, so many people are so aware of the great resources that have been there right from the start, you know, and the, and the great website that is there and the Global Rosary Relay that is held annually and the various different advertisements for that and brochures that are sent out and flyers and uh, information that is on, on the website and that. Uh, and, and I think priests feel very grateful to have that resource there and to know that there is a, an organisation, a lay-led organisation that is very supportive of priesthood and hugely appreciate that and to, to know that, that whatever resources that they can draw on are there and readily available uh, and that that great prayer source is there uh, in the, you know, the annual Glo Global Rosary Relay has grown from tiny little seeds to being a great international mm -hmm. event. Um, so I'm so delighted to see that it has grown, recently celebrated the 10th anniversary and please God it will go, go from strength to strength and continue to be a great support and resource for, for priesthood and for faith and for church in general. So I'm so thankful for the work that, that yourself and all of your colleagues in the, in, the, in the organization do in relation to that. Thank you. Um, in recent months, uh, World Priest has introduced Rosary Thursday. And the idea basically was to try and spread uh, rather than just having one day per year where we uh, pray for the sanctification of priests, that we would have maybe gentle reminders uh, on a regular basis. 
and uh, Rosary Thursday came about, we, we decided on a Thursday, because it was on a Thursday that Jesus instituted the uh, priesthood, and also because it's the only day in which the luminous mysteries uh, are, are said. And um, it's a lot less structured. Uh, it's more, it's up to you. This is provided, this is what we would like you to do. Do you think that will help as well? Oh, very much so. I think it's a, it's a great idea and it links in with what uh, was the Eucharistic adoration uh, societies are trying to do in, in all of the dioceses around the, the country. They also have Thursday as a day of prayer for, for priesthood, uh, going back to the idea that Holy Thursday was the day of the institution of the Eucharist, a call to service. Um, so it's, 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 it's redoubling, I suppose, that effort to have a specific day every week. Uh, and I think it's, it's a fantastic idea and if it's coming from two different sources, two different angles, all it can do is be a, a very, very positive help. Because priesthood, as you know, is going through a very difficult time and uh, any supports that are there. And uh, for priests to know that there are people there praying on a weekly basis, uh, it is uh, certainly a huge psychological and spiritual support, support that would be hugely appreciated and help, uh, help in, in, in so many ways. So well done on that, that new initiative. Thank you. Um, every year in your diocese, uh, a novena is held at a shrine to Our Lady in Cura Clare, I think. Um, what's the background to this shrine and to the novena? It's, it's, it's a novena that is held, starts on the Feast of Our Lady on the 15th of, of August every year uh, in a very beautiful location in, in, in West Clare. And uh, it starts always on the morning of the Feast of the Assumption, Our Lady of the Harvest and Mass is celebrated at 6 a.m. in the morning. And despite the fact that it is at, just at, at daybreak, the huge crowds attend it. Mm. And then for nine days after that, similar to the Novena in Knock, people would, would, would come and they'd celebrate Mass every day, they'd pray there. It's going back um, uh, to the early Middle Ages and even prior to that. And uh, in 18, the 1840s, there's records of huge amount of work having been done on the shrine to, to build it up. There is a holy well there. Uh, there's healing qualities that is believed to, to the water in honour of, of Our Lady, praying to Our Lady. Beautiful statue there. Uh, I go there myself normally the day after the Feast of Our Lady because we have anointing of the sick. Mm -hmm. And people gather not so much uh, around the shrine but in cars around. And so you have a huge big field and people can be anointed in their cars if they're not able to come down to the shrine. And people appreciate that hugely. So it's one of these, I suppose, local devotions that has expanded, has grown. And uh, for a lot of people, interestingly, why they mightn't attend, I suppose, the regular Sunday Mass, something like that might capture their imagination, their spiritual magnetism might be drawn towards something like that because it's a combination of faith in Our Lady, the healing waters, the beauty of nature, um, the, uh, I suppose, gathering of the body of Christ, which is the, the church in a very unique way. So something like that can capture the, I suppose, spiritual imagination of people maybe that regular church practice might not be able to do. So I, I, I feel it's very worthwhile promoting uh, some very special and unique devotion like that that has huge history uh, behind it and huge heritage and huge tradition in church terms. So it is very unique and it's very similar to the novena that is celebrated every year in, in, in Our Lady Shrine in Knock as well, which is very supportive of the mm -hmm. uh, annual global Rosary Relay really as well, indeed. Yeah, yeah, good. So finally, we're here in Dublin's RDS for the World Meeting of Families. As an Irish bishop, what are your hopes for the meeting and for the visit of the Holy Father? Well, three years of hard work has, has gone into these few days, and it, it isn't just a, a conference of, of three days or so, uh, and the next two days following that in Croke Park and the Phoenix Park. It has been a time of, of very serious preparation, of hard work, of diligence, of focusing on the whole theme of family. And uh, Pope Francis, right from the moment that he was uh, elected Pope, uh, it was clear that family, the family unit in society and in church was very important to him. And he had a synod on, on the family and uh, everybody was invited to participate in that in an online survey of how we can best support family, what are the challenges that are associated with family, and then the two separate years of family, and then the beautiful document Amoris Laetitia, the joy of, of love, the joy of the family, was produced. 
and uh, much effort has been gone into it to study uh, so much of the richness of the you know thinking on family that was there. So the past year then, every diocese has had so many events to focus in on family and the great treasure that family is for us as church. And practically everything we do as church in terms of our rituals is done through the medium of family. So it has been very enriching for us to be able to focus on that. And for myself, having it as a theme at confirmations has been such a, a blessing. Uh, the 67 confirmations that I had in, in the 58 parishes of the, the Diocese of Killaloo to be able to talk to people in the context of family and to say this is a treasure, this is something we uh, value hugely as, ch as church, whatever way we can support you as family in whatever shape, whatever size that comes in, we so much want to do that. So this conference is very much uh, focusing on that and I'm sure Pope Francis will speak very deeply on that uh, central issue which is the whole theme of the conference along with the, a lot of the topical and controversial issues that are arising as well this week. Um, but I would hope that the, I suppose the long-term fallout of this would be that we won't forget it, just like the Eucharistic Congress that was held here in this very location a number of years ago, that it will have lasting effects, that people will say, okay, family is so treasured for us, anything we can do to be able to help to support it. And we've picked out a number of areas that we can, we can do that. So I would hope that it won't be just something that was a great event that was held in 2018 in, in Dublin or in Knock, but it will have lasting effects and it will deepen our, the roots of the treasure that family is for us as church and society in so many ways. Please God. Bishop Fintan Monaghan, thank you for talking with us. You're most welcome, Niall.